Thank you. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Jennifer Becker. I'm the Deputy Legal Director and Senior Attorney with Legal Momentum, the Women's Legal Defense and Education Fund. We are the nation's oldest advocacy organization dedicated to advancing the rights of women and girls. And violence against women is a long-standing pillar of our work, as well as uh, promoting fair access to justice in our various justice systems. So today, this presentation is helping sexual assault victims navigate the criminal justice system, um, a program for victim advocates. And I'll explain how we came to this work at Legal Momentum in a few minutes, but I wanted to start by letting you know about my background and how, where my perspective in coming to this work. I started my legal career as a prosecutor where I specialized in sex crimes and child abuse. And from that experience, I saw the limitations of my role and the impact that had on sexual assault victims. And I saw the incredible benefit um, that victims had when they had a, a good relationship with victim advocates. Um, and I, have a, I had particular experience in that role working within multidisciplinary teams. And I saw firsthand how effective that could be in helping a sexual assault victim navigate the criminal justice system and finding it more accessible and being able to stay, you know, stay the course um, in the criminal justice system, which can be long. But I also saw from multi working in multidisciplinary teams the benefit and the importance in everyone involved in that team having knowledge of not only the system, but what everyone's role is within it, so that everyone could see where they could really fill a need. So this project that is bringing you this webinar today is supported by a grant awarded by the Office on Violence Against Women. And we're going to tell you more about um, the larger aspect of that project. But, but first, I just wanted, I'm sorry, I understand that people are having trouble. Yeah. I apologize, Jennifer. It looks like there might have been a glitch um, in the webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and email the uh, participants. So they are on the phone, but they're just not logged on. So I'm going to go ahead and send another link to try and get people on. Um, it'll just take about a minute. I apologize for that. No, that's OK. So why don't we take a pause and let people catch up? Um, OK, sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. So for those of you who are just joining us, I understand we had a technical issue getting started, which is now being resolved. I'm just going to pause us for a minute while we let people catch up and log on. All righty, so it looks like we have a few more people filtering in. Um, I can go ahead and pull up the poll if you're ready. Sure, thanks. Uh, for those of us just joining us, thanks for your patience. We understand there was a bit of a technical error. Um, but as you're joining, I wanted to just get us started with getting a sense for who's joining us today, um, the room being our digital room here. So if you could take a minute and just fill out the poll currently on the screen, which has a number of disciplines um, represented. OK, great. Thanks. So it looks like the majority of you are community-based victim advocates. 
Um, this is definitely going to be most directly relevant to your work, so I'm glad we have a strong showing of the advocates here today. And we can move to the next poll. So which of you, no matter which discipline um, you're coming to us from, have worked with a victim of sexual assault? Just wait for that poll. Okay, so we are having a technical issue with the rest of our polls. No worries. I think it was more important to have a sense for, um, for who's in the room today. We'll just get going with the substance here. Um, and as for those of you who have just joined us, there is a private Q&A box. Um, you're welcome to put questions in that box at any time. We'll likely address them at the end, um, but please do type them in. We can see them, and we'll address them either where it makes sense or at the end for you, or we'll follow up after the webinar. So the title of today's presentation and our project is Helping Sexual Assault Victims Navigate the Criminal Justice System. And this is an online training for victim advocates. So the purpose of our webinar today is to let you know about this resource and how you can use it. And then we'll cover some substance um, from the web course today as well. I'm going to give you a brief demo. Our website, our training website just went live this past Friday. So we'll just show you a little bit about how the site itself works. Patricia, you can go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. So this is the online training platform. And you, it is free to use. You just need to register yourself. So I'm going to demo it by showing you you'll either create an account or when you're returning to the site, you will log in. And then once you're logged in or you're a returning user, you'll see resume training here. And you can navigate either to where you left off or begin. So just one note about the content itself. You'll see that there are 12 modules or chapters, um, which are each sort of a different topic related to the criminal justice system and how advocates can bring their advocacy into the system. So all users have to take module one, which gives some really important background to the training itself and to uh, how uh, and to the some choices in the content that will give you good context as you move through it. But once you've moved through all of the pages in module one, you can take this course and in any order that you like, what's most relevant to you, or a day you have a particular question, or you can move through it from start to finish. So there are several ways to mark your progress. You'll see um, the bar on the, on the left-hand side here shows the pages. This is the content page. And after you've read it, you can click Next. And you'll just keep moving along the program like that. And here on the left-hand side, the, the, these boxes will light up with a color once you've completed that page. So that's how you'll know your progress. At the end of every module, there is a summary, which is sort of a one-pager that you could print out independently. I'm just going to move through this module to show you the end here. Um, and there's also a little quiz that will just help you. It's self-measurement here, so just give you a sense for what you retained from this module. You also have several options for downloading material. So uh, it's not easy for everyone to read from a screen. This is accessible both from a phone or a tablet as well as your computer. But 
not how everyone likes to read. I know myself, I often read in hard copy. So you have the option to download either sections, individual modules like this, or the complete set. And this will generate a really um, easy to read PDF for you, which is very printer friendly. And then um, there's also some other features. But first I wanna, so that's sort of just the technical how to get through this website and use it. But I wanna just highlight why it is that we created this program. So Legal Momentum and its National Judicial Education Program has for many years trained judges, attorneys, and court personnel and other professionals on issues related to sexual assault and the intersection of sexual assault and domestic violence. So we heard a lot over the years from victim advocates that their training typically did not give them a foundation for how the criminal justice system works, how the process unfolds, and how they can assist victims navigating the criminal justice system, or even just making the decision whether they want to navigate it at all. So several years ago, Legal Momentum undertook this project to create a new training for victim advocates that would sort of fill that knowledge gap. The intention is that it would provide advocates with a foundation in understanding the criminal justice process and empower victim advocates, victim advocates to bring their advocacy on behalf of sexual assault victims into the criminal justice system. Because we recognize that victims trust you. Um, advocates are often in the best position to have a trusting relationship with victims. So a really important caveat to this training is that it's, um, while it's meant to provide you with really helpful and substantive material about the criminal justice system, it is not meant to provide you with training towards your 40-hour training requirement um, as a victim advocate. So this, once you've navigated through every content page of this online training, you will be able to generate a certificate of completion but that doesn't take the place of any required training in your state or locality. So just um, keep that in mind. So we, uh, you know, encourage all of you to take this in whatever way is meaningful to you um, and to use it in your work. Uh, we're going to cover some of these topics today, but also know that we are available to provide technical assistance should you have any questions about the, the topics covered in this training. And then what, makes, what we hope will make this um, even more useful to you in your daily practice is we've created a state-specific supplemental guide. So much of the criminal justice process, which you'll see as we talk today a little bit about um, the system is that it's very specific to states and localities, uh, both law and even just local practice. So of course, in a training like this, we can't cover every variation to the criminal justice system around the country. So you can create a state-specific supplemental guide at your agency. There's a template that you download. Throughout the content of this web course, you'll see prompts. So there'll be a, uh, a general explanation of an aspect of the criminal justice system, and then we will refer you to find your local law or practice in the state guide. And this is the guide we're referencing. So we hope that agencies will download this guide and fill in those prompts so that you have access to that as well. And if you need assistance in developing or using the, this template, please, again, contact us. We'd be happy to uh, provide some technical assistance in using this so it's most effective for you and your practice. OK, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you, Patricia. So why is it important for advocates to help sexual assault victims navigate the criminal justice system? There are lots of reasons why victims choose not to report sexual assaults to law enforcement. We know that. But one of those reasons can be that the system itself can be intimidating, it can seem unfriendly, and it can seem inaccessible. It's certainly long in many instances. And victims hear stories of other survivors' experiences within the system, or they see it played out on TV in a way that 
um, deters them from reporting the sexual assault. So we also know that 18% of U.S. women have been raped in their lifetime from reliable studies, and that only about 16% of rapes are reported to law enforcement. Uh, these numbers come from research done by Dr. Dean Kilpatrick, as cited on the slide. And I always like to look at these numbers in light of data collected by the FBI through what's called the Uniform Crime Reporting System. It's a crime reporting system that about 18,000 law, law enforcement agencies throughout the country can contribute data to. Um, so just looking at a snapshot of that, um, data from 2015 shows approximately in excess of 200,000 rapes were reported to law enforcement, and 20 to almost 23,000 resulted in arrests. And that's only about 10.5%. And that's only 10.5% of those reported. And when we compare that to Dr. Kilpatrick's research, that only about 16% of rapes are even reported, um, certainly the number of rapes that are committed um, that result in an arrest is, is quite low. So certainly this reality plays into victims' decision making. And many, we know that many sexual assault victims are looking for someone whom they trust for information about the criminal justice system, trying to demystify it, to ease the anxiety of the unknown. Some look for this as they navigate the system, and others look for this help as they decide whether they should navigate it at all. So today I'm going to provide a brief overview of the various stages of the criminal justice system, uh, sort of a bird's eye view of the life of a case. And again, the, um, each of these stages are impacted by variation in state law and local practice. So this is a, a general overview. And I'll explain each stage on the screen in terms of its general purpose in the overall case and the victim's involvement in that stage. So the criminal justice system will be triggered, of course, by a report to law enforcement. And that is to notify law enforcement that a crime has been committed. Of course, um, the victim's role in reporting to law enforcement would be to provide a narrative of um, what it is that the victim is purporting constitutes a crime. So in a sexual assault, it would be that a sexual assault uh, was perpetrated upon them. Reports to law enforcement don't have to come from the victim. It may come from someone else. Um, but generally, law enforcement would need some substance from someone with firsthand knowledge of what crime it is they're being asked to investigate. So after a report, there would be an investigation. This includes gathering evidence, both in terms of uh, statements by witnesses, those with firsthand knowledge, and then also uh, evidence in terms of physical evidence, if there is any. So that might be articles of clothing. It might be uh, forensic evidence, blood, um, potential DNA, things like that. Um, very case dependent, obviously. The victim's role in the investigation is likely to provide a narrative. So in many instances of sexual assault, as I'm sure many of us are well aware, there aren't witnesses to the sexual assault itself. And so the only person who can provide a firsthand account to what was perpetrated is the victim themselves. So the, the investigative interview could be very long. It might happen over multiple um, occasions. And it can be very difficult. The victim is likely going to be asked to recall the sexual assault in great detail. But it's very important. Um, these details can be very important for law enforcement to track down other evidence to even know that there is a possibility of particular avenues to obtaining evidence. So the purpose of the investigation will be to determine if there is probable cause to make an arrest meaning um, is there sufficient evidence to believe that a crime has been committed and a particular person committed it. Um, the next stage would be making that arrest. 
So uh, depending on your state or locality, there may be communication between law enforcement and the local prosecutor before an arrest is made. In other places, law enforcement makes that determination on their own and then refers the case to the prosecution. The decision on whether to make an arrest or not is not in the control of the sexual assault victim, but they should be aware um, as the case progresses what determination is made. So if an arrest is made, the next step would be filing charges. And this is the stage that starts the case in a courtroom. So the prosecutor, the local prosecutor, whether they're the state's attorney or district attorney, or it's a federal case and it's the US Attorney's Office, has to file charges with the court, which is the first step in, in the courtroom. Again, whether charges are filed and what charges those are, are not the control of the victim, but they should be consulted or at least notified of what those are. The next stage is a preliminary hearing or grand jury proceeding. And which of these takes place next is dependent on local law and policy um, practice. Um, but basically, this step is um, either a hearing or a presentation to a grand jury, which is uh, a secret proceeding, but it's a, a jury of citizens um, who are tasked with hearing preliminary evidence in cases and making the decision whether or not uh, there's sufficient proof to move forward. So it's not a finding of guilt or non-guilt at this stage, whether it's a preliminary hearing or a grand jury process. It's just a determination whether there is sufficient evidence to move forward on the charges that are filed. Very often, the victim does need to testify. So if it's a preliminary hearing used in your location, that would be in a courtroom, a judge would be present, um, the defendant would have the right to be present, both attorneys, uh, the defense attorney and the prosecutor would be present, and the victim would very likely need to testify. In the grand jury proceeding, as I said, it's a secret proceeding. Um, there's no judge. The prosecutor would likely be the person who presented the victim uh, to testify. And it would be a somewhat more relaxed environment than a courtroom. The next stage, although it sort of runs through all of these stages once there's a filing of charges, are plea negotiations. So. Um, at any time, the prosecutor, the defense attorney can, and of course the defendant can come to an agreement that the defendant will plead guilty to a particular charge and that would resolve the case. Oftentimes, they will also agree to the sentence. Um, it would only be final upon appearing in front of a judge. This can happen any time before trial. This is another area where the victim does not control what the offer to uh, or what the negotiated plea will be, but they should be notified of the ongoing negotiations. The victim should be fully aware of the parameters of any agreed upon uh, plea, and they should know sort of timing in terms of when the defendant is likely to enter that plea after it's agreed upon. Um, any agreed upon sentencing, and um, we'll touch upon sentencing, which is really sort of the last stage, but, you know, assuming there is no agreed upon plea, you move on to the, to the stages of the criminal justice process that move us toward the trial. So discovery is the process by which parties in a case share information that they intend to use at trial. In a criminal case, most of that obligation is on the prosecution to turn over any evidence they have in their possession, any information that they intend to use at trial, and any information or evidence that would tend to exculpate or um, indicate that the defendant is not guilty or would be materially beneficial to the defendant. Those are sort of the, the buzzwords um, for what that standard is. And that's an ongoing obligation. So this would include reports taken by law enforcement, um, notes about the investigation, written statements by witnesses. All of that would be turned over during discovery. Um, if me Sometimes medical records would be included in this. 
Um, and we'll talk about ways that advocates can be involved in all these stages in a few minutes. So this is just the background here, but, but knowing what the prosecutor has in their possession and have an obligation to turn over to the defense is really important for victims to understand and for advocates to help them understand because it can be very personal and intimate material. So pretrial motions is the stage in which um, parties in a criminal case, very often the defendant, will ask the court for a ruling ahead of trial to exclude evidence or permit evidence. Um, one common example is the defendant and his attorney, his or her attorney may move to ask the court to exclude, um, say, uh, identification testimony. So to say that the process by which the defendant was identified as the perpetrator of the crime was flawed in some way and ask the court to exclude that evidence from ever being used in the trial. That's just one example. And there are many different, um, many different motions that can be made ahead of trial. Um, most often, these pretrial motions lend themselves to pretrial hearings where the court will consider evidence presented by both parties before making a ruling on whether any partic the particular piece of evidence at issue should be admitted. Um, although this can sort of drag out the criminal justice process, it is a very, these are very important stages because it lets everybody know ahead of time what's going to be used as evidence. Um, despite the fact that TV usually shows an aha moment at a trial, there are generally not surprise moments in a criminal trial in practice. So um, these motions and hearings ahead of trial help everybody understand and prepare around what exactly is going to be permitted. And of course, issues do crop up during the trial that will be addressed, but a bulk of them will be addressed beforehand. So assuming still no plea agreement and all of these uh, pretrial motions iron out and progress to trial, there will be a trial. So witnesses with firsthand knowledge that prove elements of the case will testify. It's at this stage that a sexual assault victim will very likely need to testify. Um, is difficult in many cases of sexual assault for the prosecution to be able to meet their burden of proof without the victim's testimony. Again, mean, most importantly for the reason that it's often the victim who's the only person who can provide critical details of the sexual assault. And the burden at a trial rests exclusively on the prosecution, and their burden is to prove that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So assuming there is a conviction after trial, which is a jury or a judge saying that the defendant is in fact guilty, the case would progress to a sentencing. Um, so Another note on trials, um, and all of, all of this is expanded on in the online training, so this is a very, very abbreviated version so that we can move on to sort of some concrete ways you might um, seek out more information or bring your advocacy on behalf of a sexual assault victim. But trials can either be what's called bench trials, which means that a judge uh, presides over the trial and also makes the decision about guilt or non-guilt. Um, deciding whether, in fact, the prosecution has meet, um, has meet their burden beyond a reasonable doubt. A jury trial is exactly what it sounds like, and the fact finder in that instance is a jury. So, again, a panel of regular citizens who get the dreaded subpoena to appear for jury duty that summons, um, who are impaneled to hear all of the evidence in a case. And in a jury trial, the judge will make decisions of law so what evidence can be admitted, for example, and the jury will make decisions of fact. And so they will make the decision about whether or not, in fact, the prosecution has meet their burden of proof by applying the facts as they have heard them to the law that the judge provides them. So at a sentencing, um, upon conviction, a defendant will be sentenced in a hearing to whatever is permissible under the crime in which, uh, for which they've been convicted. 
So this is exclusively dependent on local law. Um, every crime has a permissible range of sentences. Many vary widely from uh, the potential for community service or a fine and probation all the way to you know, many, many years in jail. So this is another area where um, you want to develop and look to your state-specific guide for information um, because this is a, an area where victims should be prepared for the range of permissible sentences but ahead of the hearing, uh, ahead of the sentencing hearing. And it's, it's an agreed upon plea. There will still be a sentencing hearing, but it's very likely that in that instance, the sentence will have been determined ahead of time by agreement of the parties. And after that starts an appeals process. So the, uh, a convicted defendant could bring an appeal for many different reasons. Um, many states uh, provide for an appeal as of right, which is a general asking an appeals court to review the evidence and um, make the determination whether, um, in fact, the burden of proof had been met and it was reasonable for the fact finder to make that determination. Another common um, avenue for appeal is for a defendant to challenge their representation uh, and the quality of their rep representation. Uh, another common avenue for appeal is newly discovered evidence. So when a defendant um, may ask the court to, um, to consider evidence that either couldn't or wasn't known at the time of the trial. Unfortunately, for victims, the appeals process can go on for many years. There may be many different um, types of appeals. And so this can be really sort of discomforting because there's a sense of closure to the criminal justice process after a sentencing. And if victims aren't um, adequately informed about appeals processes, they might be, you know, very, um, very uh, traumatized by being brought back into the criminal justice system. So there's a sort of a variety of outcomes to appeals processes too, but one potential outcome if a defendant is successful on appeal is that there may be ordered a new trial. And so the trial would restart, uh, we'd sort of rewind back to the trial phase and start all over again. And this would require presenting evidence anew as a brand new trial. And so after many years, a victim may be called to testify again. And that can be very traumatic, having to revisit all those details. So that was a, a very brief and cursory review of sort of the life of a case in the criminal justice system. And there are opportunities at every one of these stages for advocates to help victims navigate this challenging process. Your role as an advocate is to educate the victim about their rights and their options so that they can make the most informed decision about what's best for them. Um, and I caution you that as you gather information about the criminal justice system and the laws that apply within it, um, advocates aren't attorneys. And so advocates shouldn't try to provide legal advice. And not that anyone would intentionally do that, um, but be very cautious about the way that you present the information so that um, it wouldn't be seen as providing legal advice um, and that you're just providing sort of information on the process. So I also think that it's worth recognizing anytime we talk about the criminal justice system is that even though our justice system focuses on the rights of the accused, uh, for reasons that we understand because their liberty is at stake, victims are not parties to a criminal case, which means they don't have control over many of the stages, but victims are not left without any rights in this process. And that's something that as advocates, we can help focus the criminal justice system back on, that victims do have rights. So there is no federal constitutional amendment that grants victim rights, but there is a federal Crime Victims Rights Act, which provides rights for victims in federal criminal proceedings. And while these 
types of rights vary from state to state, every state has at least some protection by statute for crime victims. And um, well over 30 states have constitutional amendments that afford crime victim rights amendments. So you as an advocate want to be aware of what your state provides in terms of rights, whether they're constitutional or found in statute. Just to give you an example, on the screen right now are the provisions of the Crime Victims' Rights Act, which is the federal act. So having knowledge of all of the rights that a crime victim has can really help you um, inform the victim and identify when they should be asserting rights, when they should be asking questions to ensure their rights are being afforded, or to raise possible violations of their rights. And advocates are also very often in a position to identify um, issues with crime victims' rights being afforded along with the victim. And so if you are in a position to help them identify local victims' rights counsel, then you can help them intervene before their rights have been totally violated when they can still assert them in a meaningful way. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you might be able to form relationships where you are um, with local attorneys who you could refer victims to. Okay, so moving on to some concrete examples of how victims can, victim advocates can help victims navigate the system. At every point, at every stage, it's really helpful for the victim to have someone help them manage their expectations. Um, when the system is so um, unknown and mystifying, it's hard to um, know what to expect out of the system. So, you know, help victims understand what they can expect from the system overall or at a particular stage, helping victims prepare for the variety of outcomes. If you have the knowledge of what that range of um, expectations is, you can just help them talk through it and work through it so that they're um, constantly framing what it is the system has the ability to do. Uh, to do that, obviously, you need a good knowledge base, not only for the system at large, but for how it plays out in your individual locality, because a lot of this is based on local practice. So um, um, we're going to give you a few examples um, to make this a little more concrete. Um, so when I was practicing as a prosecutor, I had one particular case that went on for just a really, really long time. We were in our fourth year of the case, um, and it was, um, it, it was a prosecuting abuse that had gone on for many years, so it was just a really, really long road for the victim, who was actually quite young. Um, and from the time that the victim had reported the sexual abuse to law enforcement, she was engaged in mental health services with one mental health uh, professional who was excellent in her field and really um, helped the victim find a way to um, narrate the abuse um, in an effective way, to recognize her emotions surrounding the criminal justice system and the abuse itself. But very late on the case, as we were finally on the eve of trial, I got a call from a mental health professional who said, by the way, I spoke to the victim and I let her know that you can just set up closed circuit television so that she can testify from another room and doesn't have to face her abuser in person. So in fact, the law in the state where I practice did allow for what's called closed circuit television testimony, which was a live feed between a separate room and the courtroom. Um, specifically for that purpose, to alleviate um, the stress of the victim having to testify in the same physical space as the defendant. However, the law was very, very narrow. It provided this option in limited um, circumstances, and it had time prescriptions to it. So a motion had to be filed by the prosecutor, me, within a certain number of days prior to um, prior to trial, 
it had to afford the defendant an opportunity to respond. I had to meet a 13-factor um, statute and provide supporting documentation from the mental health provider. So it wasn't as simple as just setting up this technology. And so then I was left to explain to the victim why, although I would do my best, to file this motion and argue to the judge why this should be permitted, I could not make that guarantee. And the result was that it fractured the relationship. I had you know, worked a long time to gain the victim's trust, and it was fractured. And it also fractured, the, unfortunately, the victim's trust and her counselor um, for providing this, um, this stress relief in that she could just have this accommodation made for her. And she, um, her mental health was compromised and that her anxiety really escalated in those days where we were having these conversations. Um, it worked out in that we were able to have a hearing on the issue and our, in our motion to provide this accommodation was granted and it actually uh, persuaded the defendant to accept the plea offer on the table. So in the end, she never had to testify at all it was a great result and exactly what the victim wanted out of her case. But um, unfortunately, to get there, we dealt with some really anxiety-provoking um, conversations. So the, the golden rule here is don't make promises. So it's not that the mental health professional was out of line in facilitating this conversation. I had no, um, I had no way to know that this particular issue would have alleviated her stress in testifying. Um, she felt much more comfortable talking to her counselor about it. Um, and as an advocate, uh, a victim may similarly feel most comfortable sharing something like that with, a, with an advocate. Um, but making the promise, um, you don't want to do that. So you want to just facilitate the conversation, um, stopping short of promising something that you don't have control over or that no one has control over. Um, so another example to make this concrete, I'll give you as a failure on my part, and that is that I always took um, great care to explain uh, possible outcomes to a trial with a victim um, and witnesses before we started trial. So I always spent a great amount of time on various different days uh, letting the victim know um, what it would mean to get a guilty verdict, what it would mean to get a not guilty verdict, and, and always uh, in, you know, letting the victim know and reminding the victim that we couldn't make any promises. There were no guarantees. We put the best case forward, but ultimately it's out of our control and in the hands of a judge or jury. Uh, but what I never uh, did until um, I had it happen was prepare victims for the non-answer, which was a hung jury. Um, and the first time that it happened, which meant uh, the jury was deadlocked, they could not reach a decision um, on guilt or non-guilt, and after many days of deliberating over the evidence, they, um, a hung jury was declared, a mistrial was declared, meaning there was no answer at all, and we had to retry the case to move forward. Um, and I did not adequately pre prepare the victim for that outcome. And it was really stressful and anxiety provoking for her that after all of this build up and all of this time navigating the system, she got no answer at all. And we did have to retry the case. So I learned my lesson that managing expectations meant really um, talking through the full range of options and possibilities to an outcome. So I'm actually joined today um, by one of our summer legal interns Shana Weisbrot, who uh, we've been very fortunate to have with us this summer. Um, she's currently a law student, but before going to law school, she was a victim advocate in New York City. And so I asked her to join me today so that she could, um, you know, sort of give us from the perspective of a former advocate how some of this knowledge would have been helpful for her at the time. Shana, do you want to give us an example of how you saw um, managing expectations to be a really important part of this? Sure. Um, as Jennifer spoke about, um, this, the criminal justice system can be um, unpredictable from an advocate's perspective, so it's really important that we don't make promises about all of the systems that we work with. Um, and one of the systems that I used to work with frequently was called Vine, which was a national notification system. 
And often, um, with systems within the criminal justice system, um, professionals um, like uh, prosecutors or law enforcement wouldn't know how it functions on a day-to-day -day basis. They may have a higher level view. They'll refer it over to clients and their advocates or to victims and their advocates, and then the advocates would work with the uh, victims on a regular basis. Um, and what the National Notification System did find is it informed victims about the transfer or release of defendants. But it did have limitations, um, which wasn't always recognized. And the way advocates could help was that they could um, put their information into the notification system so that they were also notified along with the advocates when a defendant was transferred or released. They could call it frequently themselves or just stay in close communication with the prosecutor or the law enforcement so that if the defendant was transferred or released, they could help the victim's safety plan in real time. When they weren't able to do that from time to time, the notification wouldn't come till later, and that can be quite frustrating for a victim. So really, on both sides, making sure that um, expectations are managed on with all of the systems that we work with, um, whether it be technology-based um, or otherwise, is really important. And, and that would be that was one of my experiences. And it's a uh, it's an example that really highlights the need for coordinated community responses and good relationships between um, various folks within the criminal justice system and those who support victims um, and provide services for victims. Because um, by sharing the knowledge uh, that everyone had about the fine system, this is one particular example where um, the different professions could learn from one another about um, how how this is impacting victims in real time. And we'll talk more about building relationships towards the end today. So safety planning is another, um, another area that victim advocates can be really critically helpful. This is really sort of exclusively in the victim advocates realm here. Um, and it's something that should be used at all stages of the criminal case whenever there's a safety risk. So, um, you know, advocates should have conversations with victims as they're navigating the criminal justice system to help them determine what their needs are, if they're changing over the course of the case, and victim advocates can help victims um, when there are aspects uh, of safety planning that would be helpful for professionals within the criminal justice system to assist with to help have that conversation with whether it's law enforcement or the prosecution, um, help the victim have those conversations where the criminal justice system can be helpful in, uh, in, in safety planning and putting those safety measures in place. So orders of protection are a big area here for advocacy help for victims. Um, in a criminal case, very often the victim is issued an order of protection, um, you know, other phrases for this are restraining order, protective order, um, so you may know it by that word, um, by those phrases. But very often, victims have an order of protection in their favor throughout the life of the criminal case. And what those orders look like varies somewhat based on the locality you're in, the state you're in, but most have the ability to be tailored to a particular victim's needs to their case, but generally those requests have to come from the prosecutor who is the party to the case because the victim is not. And so as advocates, you can have conversations with victims about what they would need in an order of protection to feel truly protected. Um, you know, the typical exclusions are stay away from the home and place of employment of the victim, um, refuse, you know, refrain from communicating with the victim. But is there a particular way in which the victim, uh, the defendant is communicating with the victim that they, they need written into that order of protection? Um, some places have been more proactive than others about including uh, electronic communications. And this is an area that victim advocates can help the victim communicate to the justice system about the need for orders of protection that specify means of communication that are often used by the defendant um, to keep them safer. 
if there's gaps in safety, advocates can have conversations um, with the prosecutor. And um, if the victim, of course, consents uh, to acting in that way. Uh, but the thing to know about orders of protection is that they're only as, go only as good as they are enforced. So it's good to remind victims about how orders of protection operate. As advocates, you can remind victims to keep a copy of the order of protection on their person at all times. Um, you can help them understand how to report a violation of the order of protection. Very often in the criminal justice system, the uh, orders of protection need to be renewed during the life of the case. And so making sure they always have the most current copy uh, that it's been provided to them, helping them obtain it when they don't have it. These are all areas that advocates can be really helpful um, for victims. Um, things like lock changes um, to ensure safety, emergency shelter. Of course, these are things that I'm sure as victim advocates, you all know how to do very well. Um, and But there may be instances when to act swiftly for a victim, it would be helpful or it's necessary to have documentation from someone within the justice system. So helping victims communicate that uh, to the various justice system professionals. And some of that is having good relationships, again, in the community. Um, but again, you know, advocates are really the experts to hear. And so, you know, elevate your advocacy to within the justice system because you can use that to your advantage, the ability of the justice system to enhance your ability to safely plan with the victim. And again, you should know what resources are available and needed. And this is another area that really doesn't pertain to any particular stage in the case, but something that is squarely within the victim advocate's role to do best. So there are times when victims have to focus on meeting their concrete needs, you know, their, their basic life needs. And it can be difficult to pay attention or to cope with navigating the criminal justice system when you have to meet your primary needs and those aren't met yet. So this is another common area that reduces cooperation with the criminal justice system because even if a victim begins navigating the system and they're dealing with trying to meet these primary needs in a case that's dragging on a while, sometimes victims will just, you know, drop out and say, you know, I, I can't do this anymore because I, I just have bigger issues that I need to resolve um, that need my attention. Um, and the justice system is really not always set up to understand that and to address it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can help um, advocates and prosecutors understand um, what the victim experience might be when they're coping with a criminal case and they have um, these really difficult concrete needs that take up a lot of their emotional space and their time. Um, prosecutors won't really know um, what's going on for the victim necessarily. They may not know that the victim doesn't have a phone. Um, they may not know that the victim's living in a shelter. Um, and that it's not that the victim doesn't care about the case, but that they have to, to focus on their needs first, like looking for a house or a new job, um, or even just not having a phone. Um, if the sexual assault stems from a domestic violence relationship, the victim may also be experiencing a loss of income, which makes it even more difficult for them to focus on the criminal case. Um, so in these times, it's really helpful to, to stay in constant communication with the prosecutor, to let them know what's going on with the victim with their permission and based on the confidentiality requirements, but to let them know the circumstances that the victim are, is facing and that it may not be that they're not, it's not that they're not interested, but they're not, they're hard to reach or um, having difficulty staying available. Um, so you can stay in contact with the prosecutor and talk to them about the victim experience, but also um, when the victim is available, be the link between the victim and the prosecutor to let the victim know what's going on with the case and really how important it is for them to stay involved um, so that they can have um, their input on the criminal case and, and really feel like they are a part of the process. Um, so when there's challenges in their life, it can be really difficult um, to stay focused on that criminal case. So advocates have a really unique position to help out there. 
Thanks, Shana. Yeah, and I think that touches on a few of the things we've already talked about, which is, you know, managing expectations, and part of that is understanding what uh, the expectation is of the victim, um, at, because uh, for prosecutors to bring a case and be successful at meeting their burden of proof, very often that imposes an expectation on the victim um, to be available as a witness, um, because they hold the most important evidence in most of in most sexual assault prosecutions. So understanding what the expectation is of them. Um, and this also weaves into the need for having, you know, great relationships um, in your communities with other legal service providers outside the criminal justice system. So when these competing needs that might be drawing the victim's attention away from the criminal justice system or making them feel like they just, it's not for them to continue navigating it, sometimes that's the result of some civil legal needs. So uh, for example, immigration, um, then if you as an advocate have relationships with other legal service providers that you can make a quick reference, get someone on the phone uh, to help set up um, you know, an initial meeting, uh, that might go a long way to a victim just being able to navigate all of their legal needs. Um, and of course, this is all contingent on whether it is that the victim wants to navigate the criminal justice system. That's a different question. But when they want to navigate it, but they feel like they're prevented because of other things going on in their lives, that's something that advocates can help them sort of sort through and, and um, attend to. Um, and it also, uh, shows really the need for advocates to have a good understanding of what rights victims have with respect to the criminal justice system, because um, some of knowing the resources available, especially civil legal needs, might actually um, coincide with a right that they're owed or a right that they have that they can assert uh, related to the criminal justice process. So for example, um, you know, is there hesitation, um, a privacy concern, over records that are um, being subpoenaed by the defendant about their um, mental health, for example. Is that what is holding the victim back from continuing to navigate the criminal justice system? And um, can a victim's rights attorney intervene and put the victim's concerns and, and their rights before the criminal court um, in that instance? Because it's not always in the prosecutor's ability to assert um, assert those rights. So this lends itself to navigating simultaneous court cases or processes. Um, this is another, you know, common reason why uh, sexual assault victims who otherwise want to get justice in the criminal justice system just feel like it's too much and they can't continue navigating the process when they are also navigating other court cases or administrative processes. So that might be a civil court case. Um, it might be a child custody proceeding going on. It might be a divorce proceeding going on or um, involvement with the family from Child Protective Services, which may be uh, directly or somewhat related to the criminal case or not, but just can be really burdensome uh, to the victim and really anxiety provoking and might be a reason why, despite the fact that they wanted to navigate the criminal justice system, they just feel like they can't. But it also might be that the simultaneous processes are just going on parallel tracks and not communicating to one another, as they often do not do, and that the victim can't manage their expectation for any system because they're being impacted by one another and just moving along um, on parallel tracks. So as a victim advocate, you're actually really in a great position to help parallel processes communicate with one another. So for example, if there's a criminal case going along on its track and there is a family court proceeding that um, is um, at least in part related to that that's going along in its track. The victim is involved in both. They may be testifying in both. It may be happening at different uh, speeds. 
And you, as an advocate, are really in the best position to know from the victim what they're being told about the way each process is, is unfolding, and then to bridge the knowledge gap between the two systems, whether up from you directly as the advocate on behalf of the victim or helping the victim know what information they should be sharing with the different systems. And that may be as simple as letting the, the prosecutor handling the criminal case know that the victim has um, been you know, uh, subpoenaed to testify in the family court case um, or has provided testimony in a civil case. Um, it could be as simple as just making that notification. So um, you're in a good position to do that. Um, so check in with victims that you're working with about, even if they're only asking you questions about the criminal process, check in. Are they also navigating other processes that are impacting the criminal case or their ability to stay up with it and stay in contact with the criminal justice system and help them work through that? And then there's direct advocacy with law enforcement and the prosecutor as the stages of the case unfold. So we've actually gotten a few questions in the, in the Q&A box, uh, sort of on the point of, you know, how as a victim advocate do you respectfully challenge decisions um, by professionals within the criminal justice system? And there will be times when your most effective role on behalf of the victim will be to challenge either pro the way they have undertaken specific processes, stages, or decision making that's happened, or maybe the failure to give victims information in a timely way. So the, the most important piece of advice that we can give you as advocates is to build a strong relationship. Um, you know, as community-based advocates in particular, if you're a system-based advocate, obviously you're going to have that relationship, um, but because you won't have a privileged relationship with the victim, you'll have a different relationship with the victim. As a community-based advocate, you, um, depending on where you are, you very often will have a privileged relationship in your communications with the victim, but you may not have or feel like you have a direct line of communication with local law enforcement and the prosecutor's office. So trying to find ways to build that relationship so that you feel like you have someone you can go to in a non-confrontational way and get information that the victim either isn't getting or maybe misunderstands and just needs someone else to help them um, work through what it means for their case. Um, building these relationships is key. So many of your agencies may already have these relationships, but maybe you don't have them specific to advocating on behalf of sexual assault victims, and so revisit it. Um, you, there may be uh, coordinated community responses already happening in your uh, locality, but maybe community-based advocates, the agencies are not involved in those. So are there already multidisciplinary responses to sexual assault happening that your agency can take part in? Um, so that you can build those relationships and share information, share knowledge, which is, which is key here. Um, but even if you don't have that relationship built out yet, um, if, the prop, if the victim shares with you um, the particular investigator or prosecutor assigned to their case, you can communicate with them for regular status updates. Um, for some victims, this is really helpful for advocates to do for them. Um, sometimes it's overwhelming to receive the updates themselves. They have a hard time sort of working through what it means their case. And um, in my practice as a prosecutor, um, there were victims I worked with that really felt more comfortable if I communicated updates to them and their advocate simultaneously. And then the advocate would work through with them what that update was and what it meant for their case, and then would follow up with me on, okay, these are the questions we still have outstanding. Can you help us understand them? Can you help the victim understand them? And that was really effective for some, for some vic individual victims. So that may be a, an approach that you take. Um, and Shana had sort of a discrete issue that continually um, she faced as an advocate. 
So one of the most frustrating aspects, I think, of the criminal justice system that I uh, came across that clients or victims experienced um, was when they would receive subpoenas. Um, subpoenas are mandates to appear, but Jennifer can give more information about specifically what they are and what the requirements are about them. But um, the victim's experience is that when they receive them, they can be very intimidating. Um, there really isn't any wiggle room around them. It's on their time. It's on the criminal justice system's timetable as to when they have to be there, when they have to show up, um, and they really can't be changed. Um, so the best thing that I can say as an advocate really is to advise your uh, the victims to appear and have a discussion about their, reserva their reservations with them rather than not appearing or avo avoiding phone calls because um, there may be further consequences from that. Um, if you have a discussion with them about their reservations and sort of what's holding up um, their what what's uh, what their fear is about about appearing and if they want to proceed with the criminal case or not. Again, they may not be able to do anything about the subpoena, but the advocate and the victim together um, with permission can express to the prosecutor the reservations that they have about moving forward. So it may demystify um, the subpoena for them and it may help them understand a little bit better why they have to show up. Um, at that date and time and why they don't necessarily have a choice around it. Um, I, I found that to be one of the most ex emotional experiences for the victims that I worked with um, in, in a system where they feel like they, where they may feel like they don't have much control and that seems to reduce the control even further. Um, it's important to have these open, honest conversations and say, okay, I may not be able to change this for you, but let's see what we can do in the conversations that we can have to help. Yeah, and this raises um, a lot of good points for advocates to consider um, as you're working with a victim who is uh, trying to navigate the criminal justice system. Um, as, as most of us, I think, um, on this webinar today know, trauma impacts everyone differently. Um, but for some, the, um, you know, subpoena to appear or you know, even an informal call to say you need to come in and prepare for testimony, or um, you know, ha be interviewed at the investigative stage. Um, you know, might be so triggering as to just sort of make the victim um, avoid it, uh, which is you know a reaction to the anxiety or not knowing what to expect you know, a whole host of reasons of trauma itself. Um, but on the other end of that, um, the criminal justice system, very oftentimes, if they are not uh, getting a response from the victim who may be the only one with the evidence that would prove the case, um, may be forced into a situation where without the victim's cooperation, they have no choice but to dismiss the charges. So as a victim advocate, you're well positioned sort of is the bridge to that. Um, is the victim making the decision to disengage with the criminal justice system because they don't want to move forward and they just don't want to navigate the system, which may be the case? Or are they just being deterred by the trauma of the system or of the sexual assault? Um, and that's sort of preventing them from responding in a meaningful way and can you bridge can you bridge that gap and be the communication to the justice system to say um, you know maybe the victim needs some additional time and maybe the prosecutor can actually get that time if they know that that's what the victim is working through um, so that's a really important place uh, bridge that that advocates um, can be between the system um, and the victim before it's too late before uh, the system is just n not able to respond at all. Um, so another point to how to respectfully challenge, there will be instances where an ad as an advocate, the only way to advocate for a client is to challenge the decisions that are being made. Um, to you know, raise to law enforcement that they are not looking at the evidence uh, through a trauma-informed lens. Um, but the, the, the only way that you can do this effectively is to have the knowledge about the system itself and what it is capable of doing and not capable of doing. So I think that's critical too, is arming yourself with that information. So not just the broad 
information like we hope that you'll take from the online training, but also in that really critical local information, local practice and state law. So another uh, concrete uh, thing that advocates can do for victims at every stage is provide emotional support. Um, and really, really, you should not underestimate the power of your emotional support throughout the criminal justice system. Um, it might be that as an advocate, you accompany the victim to every court appearance that they either need or want to be at, because a consistent, um, friendly face, someone they know is only interested in their own, the victim's interests, can be powerful in itself, um, because there are not a lot of people within the justice system that can provide that. And many victims don't want their families to provide that, because they don't want their families to hear the details of the sexual assault, or there may be many reasons why they're looking for um, an advocate to be that person for them. Um, critically important, too, is advocates are best positioned to help the vic victim formulate their thoughts and their feelings about how about navigating the criminal justice system, about things like the plea negotiations that are going on. So, you know, they're informed of a plea offer that's going to be made to the defendant, and maybe they don't feel like they are empowered to voice how they feel about it to the prosecutor. So advocates are best positioned to help victims formulate how they feel about things like, like a plea offer and strategize with them about how can you raise your concerns? How can you ask your additional questions and support them through that? Um, another really important aspect for advocates, um, which we didn't really get to touch on in this, but what is explained in the online training are victim impact statements, which are statements generally allowed at sentencing hearings um, for the victim to speak. And it's really the only time in the criminal justice system that the victim has the right to speak about the impact the sexual violence had on them um, and, and is not restrained to only talking about the facts of the sexual assault. But it can be really anxiety provoking and triggering for a victim to try to put um, you know, pen to paper or stand in a courtroom and speak to the impact that a sexual assault has had on them. And um, in my experience, advocates were the most helpful to victims in um, sort of, you know, formulating these thoughts. Uh, but also asking the question, what does justice look like to you, is really, it's simple, um, but it's incredibly empowering. And after such a, you know, disempowering um, experience like being subjected to sexual violence, being asked, what does justice look like to you, number one, you might be surprised by the answer, but you also might be surprised that nobody else has asked the victim this question. So if no one's asked them or listened to the answer, you should ask them. And then you should listen to the answer, and you should help the victim figure out who else needs to know that answer. Because by working through the question, what does justice look like to me, um, a victim may answer for themselves whether it's worth navigating the criminal justice system or seeking justice in another way. Um, so that's something that you can do every time you support a crime victim and then help them work through what their answer is. So we talked a lot about building partnerships in, in your community. Um, you should, you know, if you don't already have relationships with, uh, you know, professionals in your, in your location that uh, are within the criminal justice system, like law enforcement, local prosecutor's office, community advocates and system-based advocates to really have a great relationship, to know what resources each other can provide for victims, because um, the re access to resources that you have might be different. Um, court per having relationships with court personnel, the clerk who can provide copies of orders of protection, um, all you know, good folks to have a relationship with. And when the opportunity arises for you to advocate on behalf of a client, when you know who to pick up the phone and call, and when you know what it is that they have the power to do within their role, it'll be you know, much more efficient for you to provide that help. Also, we mentioned this a few times, but having relationships with 
civil legal service providers and victims' rights attorneys and immigration attorneys, um, you know, attorneys outside of the criminal justice system who can assist victims with other legal needs that might be preventing them from navigating the criminal system when that's what they want to do. Um, again, you know, knowing these people that you can refer a victim to or pick up the phone and, and call and flesh out an issue with um, will make, make it much more efficient for you to provide that advocacy. If you don't have relationships with this, some of you may work in agencies that have attorneys like this on staff, and that's fantastic. Um, but if you don't, or if you do, and you have a very small team, one way that you can go about building these relationships is to approach your local bar associations, which are associations of local attorneys. And you can explore the possibility of creating training together. And maybe the goal of that training would be to enhance the number of attorneys in your area who are willing to take crime victims' cases. Um, or maybe it's providing training to um, attorneys to learn about the services that a community-based um, advocacy organization can um, provide um, with a referral. So that's, a, that's an avenue that you can all take. There are local bar associations everywhere. And the other thing that we recommend is as you explore these relationships is enter into memorandums of understanding. So these are just basically agreements between multidisciplinary agencies or organizations towards a common goal like addressing sexual assault in your community. They're not a contract. They can be informal um, or as formal as you want them to be. Um, if your community has a sexual assault response team, um, then there likely is an MOU. But think expansively about the arrangements or relationships that you might want to put a memorandum of understanding in place. Because there's a lot of benefits to having one, even if they're really informal. Um, you know, one, it just very simply provides a guiding document for everyone involved, and it gives everyone in the relationship a clear sense of their own duties and the duties of everyone else. And it provides accountability. So when you, you know, put pen to paper to put together this memorandum of understanding, it's a document that you can continue to reflect on um, and uh, hold each other accountable to the role that you should serve in the community for addressing sexual violence. And just going through the process of formulating a memorandum of understanding will identify certain individuals in every organization or agency as a point person, and you'll know who to go to. And these relationships will become a lot more concrete when you um, have liaisons and a lot easier to have open lines of communication when you know who to go to. So just a couple tips at creating one. Um, in you know, whatever form it, it makes sense in your community. But you should try to incorporate a responsibility for every agency and organization who's part of it to do cross trainings for everyone else. So that everyone in that memorandum of understanding knows what each other, what their function is, what the scope of their role is, and can provide training from their own perspective on how, how their role and everyone else's role impacts. Um, victims of sexual violence. You should incorporate procedures for releasing information between participants. So even though you're part of this MOU, you each party to the MOU will have different privacy responsibilities. So you have to be very um, open and thoughtful about the processes you put in place to ensure that you're all respecting your own obligations under the law um, regarding privacy and confidentiality. Um, you know, to the point about open lines of communication, uh, designate a point person who is going to maintain the relationship and coordinate the cross trainings and continued conversations. And just overall, enter the agreement or the, you know, come to the table to form a memorandum of understanding with no ego. So dump that mentality that anyone has a particular turf and approach it as, our community has a collective problem, and we can all help address it. And the most critical part of having an MOU is don't stop at going through the exercise of formulating it and signing it, but have follow through. So have um, meetings, follow-up meetings, whether they're monthly or quarterly, and reassess how it's working for your community. Hear everybody's concerns, how it's working, how it's not working, 
bring case examples to the table, to talk through as a group, and make this a living document. Continue to update it and let it evolve so that it, it best serves your own community. So there are a couple examples that you can find online. Um, if you search for the Memorandum of Understanding, there's one available through the Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime, and there's another um, through the White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault. If you're having trouble finding either one of them or, and you'd like an example or some other tips on developing an MOU, please just reach out to us. We are happy to, to talk through that with you or help you find an example. So the goal of all of this, even though this was a really abbreviated and bird's eye view of the criminal justice system and how as an advocate you can bring your advocacy to the system on behalf of a sexual assault victim, the goal of, of spending any time and attention to this is to ensure that the criminal justice system operates in a trauma-informed and victim-centered way while at the same time continuing to protect criminal defendants' rights. Advocates are, you know, uniquely positioned to advance these goals, um, but you can't do it alone. And no, no, per, you know, no role within the criminal justice system can do it alone. But information is the first step. So we hope that you'll utilize the online training to get more detailed information about all of this. We hope you'll use the state-specific guide in your agencies to develop that local content um, and build relationships. And we are here to provide technical assistance on, on any of that. Um, so we under, so I'm going to put up uh, my contact information, and you are welcome to contact me at any time. The slides are also available in the file box, which has my contact information as the last slide there. Um, and I know that we had a little bit of trouble towards the beginning of getting, uh, getting folks in the webinar room. So I, I am going to go back to um, one of the early slides, which had the web address to the training that I keep referencing. And, and here it is here. So for any of you that missed it, it's a free training. You just have to register. Um, it keeps track of your progress. So you can do it in one sitting, on many sittings. You can go back and refresh yourself with the information. Anytime it becomes relevant to your practice, uh, you can download the information and make a hard copy of it. And when you go to that site as well, you can, there is a, an easy and obvious way to contact us. So if you lose these slides with my contact information, you can still get to us by um, hitting the contact button on the website. So if there are any remaining questions before we close out, type them in the Q&A box, and we're happy to address them in the last couple minutes here. So there was one question about certificates of completion with respect to the online training. When you've navigated through every page and read all of the content, it will automatically generate a certificate of completion for you. Um, and again, in case you missed the caveat here, this program is not intended to take the place of any required training that your state might have, like the 40-hour sexual assault advocate training. Um, it's really supplementary, but in case you know your employer wants a completion for the time you spent on it, it will generate it for you. If you'd like a certificate of completion for this webinar, you are welcome to email njep at legalmomentum.org. That's njep at legalmomentum.org. And we're happy to make one for you and send it to you. And if you missed that, again, just contact me directly on the last slide of the PowerPoint. So, in our last couple minutes, we've gotten a question about Title IX, which um, for anyone who's not aware, Title IX is a civil rights law which um, bars discrimination based on sex and education and in, includes a mandate or has been interpreted to include a mandate that schools must respond to sexual violence um, on campus as that constitutes sex discrimination. So that's 
separate as a civil rights law that's separate from the criminal justice system that is an area though that some sexual assault victims might be simultaneously navigating when they navigate the criminal justice system so for example if a sexual assault happens on a campus the victim may choose to navigate both the criminal justice system and their school mace process um, or one or the other so so while we haven't covered it today and it's um, a different process there is an entire module on this in the web course. I think it's actually module 12, the last one, which talks about the differences between the two processes and ways that advocates can help a victim make the decision on which to navigate or you know, navigating both. So thanks for that question because there's certainly a lot of crossover. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining us today. There's a couple questions just rolling in now, so we um, will follow up offline. If you could just type in with your question your email address, we'll respond to you offline. And if you're still sort of thinking through your questions, feel free to email us afterwards. Thanks for joining this afternoon.